one of the most complex. It's a pretty simple thing, actually. So we heard from uh, Francesco, he talked about uh, OTP a little bit on OTP behaviors. Uh, OTP applications is uh, another behavior that, that comes bundled with uh, the Beam, so the Erlang VM. And the, the idea of an uh, OTP application is, is that you have diff these different uh, processes running and there's a supervision tree uh, and that's all packaged in a bundle that you can then send to other uh, or the other beams, and that it will just run to deploy. That that's just a, a convention of how to bundle applications. Uh, umbrella apps are nothing more really than a, another convention of how to have multiple applications inside of a bigger bundle. That's your umbrella. That's going to wrap them all together. Uh, now, what's the the advantage you might ask of having an umbrella app versus just having many apps? Uh, it, it's really just about the convention, I think. So there, the, your tooling is going to be aware of this. So for instance, Mix, uh, Peter was talking about Mix, the, the tool, uh, very important tool if you're doing Elixir. If you run tests, you can run the tests for all the applications together. Uh, when, so th that's a, a big thing uh, for dependencies as well. If you run Mix Depths Get on the top app, it will get the dependencies for all the applications. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, if you're using Phoenix, which is the one of the main web frameworks for uh, Elixir. It's also aware of what umbrella apps are, and if you create a new Phoenix app inside of the umbrella, uh, the generators will behave a little bit differently. Uh, Distillery, which is a deployment library, also is aware of umbrella apps and even allows you to deploy as a single app, or you can specify how you want each different app to behave when you're deploying. So. It's, it's just uh, really a, a convention and, and a nice convention to have these different apps that are, are all, re or if you want to call them services, they're all part of this uh, bigger bundle. The way you, st you start uh, or you create a new umbrella app uh, is really just using mix new, same thing as you're, when you're creating a, a regular Elixir app, but you, you have the dash dash umbrella uh, at the end. That's an option. So this will create these files. Particularly interesting is this apps directory instead of a lib directory. Uh, and this apps directory is going to be empty at first. So there's really no uh, application code because this is just a, a, a bag for you to put your applications. And then it's as easy as really CDing into this apps directory and doing mix new and creating apps inside of there. And that's it. Uh, as simple as that. So that's about it. About Umbrella apps that I wanted to talk uh, talk to you about the technicals of it. It's really this simple. Uh, the part that really excites me and really got me into uh, umbrella apps and how they could be used is more uh, about how to build a maintainable application or what I think uh, could be a ways to, to build a, a more maintainable application. And then, uh, so I want to talk about a little bit about this and then how to apply this to, to umbrella apps. Uh, so it, right now, uh, there's a lot of frameworks out there, uh, and I'm not going to focus specifically on web, but that's mostly what I do. So uh, if something doesn't make sense, maybe I'm just talking about web frameworks. Uh, but there's a lot of frameworks that make it easy to build an app, but not necessarily a maintainable one. So f very famously, uh, Rails, a few years back, had the 15-minute blog. And yeah, that's cool. I can make a, a blog in 15 minutes, but if that blog grows to be like a, a major thing, will the same patterns still, still hold true uh, for a bigger team and for uh, different scalability uh, problems that I might, might have? Some symptoms that I've, I've seen in my experience uh, starting to express themselves when uh, you start ha having these issues of, of the framework not really being maintainable, maintainable and not scaling with, with the team and the, uh, and the project uh, is something that, that happens. Is you, you can start to have uh, these very large files as your app grows, because a lot of things just keep going to the same files, and that just just became become this bucket of behavior that uh, is really hard to understand, which leads to a slower pace in getting stuff out the door, uh, and this is obviously the the biggest issue actually. Um, this is also due, uh, in my opinion, to a, a, a high coupling between your components, which means you start having these different classes or modules or whatever packages, and they're all very coupled to each other. They all tr try to get uh, behavior and communicate with each other when sometimes they, they really shouldn't. There's just uh, 
a level of abstraction or some abstractions that you're doing that, that are not really correct. Um, another thing that you start seeing is low cohesion, uh, which means that inside of these classes or these modules, you, you, you start to have a lot of behavior that doesn't really uh, match uh, with the rest of the behavior on the class. Uh, a very common example of this is, for instance, in a web app, uh, the user class or the user model where you can start, you have like behavior for like authentication or uh, something like that and then you, you start adding things more specific to your app to, the, to that user model as well and then you're now really conflating these uh, concepts that shouldn't be uh, together and that leads to uh, these large files and sort of base and all of that. So this is some of the symptoms that I, that I see and I, I believe they all come from this uh, overarching problem which is uh, not really thinking about how to model your domain and that's uh, a little, what I really wanted to talk about to you today. Um, so for me, and uh, this is debatable, uh, an ideal application uh, with all the trade-offs that come with this is one that's uh, easy to understand and easy to change. That's something that, uh, that's what I really focus on when I'm developing or thinking of, uh, about how to structure an application. Uh, it's about this, mainly these two main things uh, because I, I really want for it to be uh, easy to understand by new team members, for instance. That, that's an important thing. So smaller methods or smaller functions, smaller modules, that's usually uh, helpful, easy to change. Uh, there's a trade-off again here because if you have a lot of these small modules, then knowing which models are being called and what the, the, the function path is, is going to look like for a, a simple process can be hard, so uh, trade-offs here. Uh, a really thing, the thing that's very important to have in mind and a quote that I really like uh, is this one, that the system is the asset. Uh, the code is, is really a liability. So what I mean here is that with, with all I'm going to be talking about, if I was able to have my system and have a product that works and uh, really with zero lines of code, that would be ideal for me. And that's kind of uh, contradictory to the geek within us all, right? Like we, we like to write code, but uh, on a professional setting, that's not really what you're being paid to do most of the times. You're being paid to solve a problem, not really write code. Code is just the, the way you solve that problem. Uh, so a way that I like and of uh, thinking about how to solve these problems uh, is uh, domain-driven design. So that's uh, something that we're going to talk uh, about now. Uh, Domain-driven design, which I'll be calling DDD from now on because it's just shorter, is uh, more or less like a, a theoretical. It has some actual patterns and stuff that you're going to use. I'm going to talk about some of the more th theoretical ideas about domain modeling. Uh, so you have your problem and then how are you going to structure your code to uh, be able to, uh, to achieve the separation of context and all of that. The first thing, thing that I, uh, I wanted to, to stress, because uh, again, in my experience, this is something that most people don't even talk about and don't even think about when building applications, um, are subdomains. Subdomains represent something on your uh, problem space, and that's the, the real difference. And uh, because we're mostly working and thinking about our solution space, so how are you going to solve things? And we don't really talk about uh, the, the problem space a lot. So here I have an example of uh, two different subdomains, which are sales and support. So these are things that exist for our product. We have a, a sales team and a sales part of the product and a support part of the product. And uh, subdomains can have, can be different types. Uh, I here have an example of two of them, there are three. So first of all, there's the, our core domain. We have to think of what is the main thing that our problem is solving, what is our core competency as a, uh, as a company. And uh, so that is going to be uh, a part of the product that you're really going to focus on. I, you have support subdomains. Uh, so support is something that you're building yourself still. It's important to the company, but it's not really the core thing you want to do. 
And then you have generic subdomains, as I have there, for support, which still is something that you need, but it's probably something that you, you can get off the shelf. Uh, a good example of a, supporting sub, a generic subdomain, something like a, a payment system, you can just use Stripe or Braintree or Dwalla or whatever you're using. Uh, you, you have a, a small adapter layer, and that just works. You can switch them off, and as long as it takes a token and an amount to, to get a payment, then that's fine. So those are subdomains. Now, when you move to the solution space in, in thinking about these things, uh, you, come, you come to the bounded context. Bounded context can have a one-to-one -one relationship uh, and do have a one-to-one -one relationship a lot of times with subdomains, but they're not, not necessarily the same thing. But here we have our subdomains, and we have a different context for, e for each of uh, the subdomains. And the way it's called context is because really what bounded contexts are about is uh, defining uh, a boundary between parts of the system that have different uh, languages that they speak, okay? Uh, an example, uh, a good analogy, I think, to think about subdomains versus bounded context and what the difference is, is if you think of a floor, like you have a room like this, you have a floor, and you have a carpet, okay? So your subdomain is gonna be the floor, uh, and you're gonna, you want to walk on, a, on the floor, and you, you can put a carpet, and it, if it's cut exactly to the size of the, the floor, then you have a one-to-one -one mapping between the floor uh, and the carpet. So that's your subdomain and your bounded context. But, uh, and to show like how a solution space is different than a problem space, you can have a floor and imagine it has some holes in it. Now your, your bounded context can, be, it can still be the carpet, but if I'm walking through a hole, I might trip. So a better solution might be to fill the hole and then put the carpet on top. Uh, so continuing the analogy, the floor is still the, 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 the problem space, is still a subdomain, but the filling of the holes plus the carpet is now your solution, so there's two things to your solution, okay? So that's why uh, there's a, these are different things uh, to solving th this problem. Uh, now, going a little bit deeper into bounded, the bounded context, the ones we were talking about here, sales and support, you can see here the different entities that we are using inside of each of th these different contexts. Uh, you have for sales like opportunity, pipeline, and support has ticket and defect and some other stuff. The, the, the more interesting ones for me are customer and product, because you can see them, they are in both. So what this means is they have the same name, but they are in different contexts. That's what I'm talking about, the uh, language. Uh, this is a language, uh, we call it a ubiquitous language. So that means that the sales team, from top to down of the, the whole organization, that, that means uh, the domain experts or your sales team developments, when they talk about a customer within the sales context, then that's like a sales customer. It might be not even a paying customer yet, something that you're, you're, something that you're trying to sell to. Within the support context, that's probably already a paying customer that has some issue. So they are slightly different, and you want to model them as different things. Uh, and here, uh, just making the parallel to umbrella apps a little bit, here's where I, I would separate each context into a different application, okay? So it will be like a different service, and each model will be, will be represented in each of these applications because they represent different things. And now you're not conflating those contexts as I was uh, talking about, like in the user model. Because user, if you think about it, is really a bad name. Because uh, user can represent so many things. It can be an account, it can be a customer, it can be an author. There's so many names for what a user can do, and that's why they are uh, often called behavior magnets, because if you just say user, that's so generic that everything is going to want to go in there. Uh, and so thinking about, the, this, uh, thinking about it in, in this way helps with that. Uh, especially one very important thing about this that I, I kind of uh, not really said yet is this is all about communication. What I'm talking about here, coming up with these names, this terminology, separating of context, this is all about talking with uh, the main experts, talking with the stakeholders, getting everyone together and, and having this uh, shared uh, glossary of, uh, of information. Uh, an another benefit of this is then now, uh, as I said, these applications, uh, if you implement them uh, as applications, can be deployed separately. They can be scaled separately. So if we need, we have a, a higher 
needs in terms of uh, users for sales, let's say, or for support, we can have 10 support servers and servers and just one for sales. They can really, uh, they are completely independent. That's the whole idea. Again, to kind of uh, drive this point through, uh, if you think about tomatoes, uh, to tomatoes, like, it's a simple thing, you think about it. But in, cu in culinary, so in cooking, a tomato is seen as a vegetable. In the botanic world, it's seen as a fruit. Uh, in theater or movies, uh, it's like feedback, like from the rotten tomatoes thing. Uh, and even, uh, I'll add another one, if you think of the Pomodoro technique uh, for producti productivity, a Pomodoro is a tomato. That's, you're counting units of productivity. So just for a simple thing as a tomato, we can see four completely different things that uh, it can mean in different contexts. Uh, so that's kind of the idea of what bounded contexts mean, is thinking about uh, where the same concepts, or different concepts, but uh, the, 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 the ones that have the same name are the, are the more, more interesting ones, uh, what they, the, the slightly differences they have when uh, talking about it in different contexts. And the, the reason it's important to think about these contexts and separate them is uh, that having a, a domain model that models everything is pretty much impossible. So that's why you want to break, break it into different contexts and have this separation. Uh, again, because I, I know this, uh, thinking about this, if, you, if you've never uh, seen a domain model this way, it, it's, it's not easy, uh, at least it wasn't for me at first. So I, I want to give you another example. Uh, we're having, we have sales, and now we have shipping instead of support, and we added our course of domain, which is ma manufacturing. And here we see an example of manufacturing has a manufacturing context. That's a one-to-one. -one. Shipping has a shipping context. That's a one-to-one. -one. Uh, but sales has two contexts, okay? We have sale, the sales context, which if you think about it as an application, that's an application on our side that we implemented ourselves. Uh, but then we have an external context, which is a, a CRM that the sales team uses. So that's something that we want to uh, represent here. And it's part of the sales context. Like, on the CRM, the terminology that we use is going to be the terminolo terminology that we use within the sales context. So for instance, a customer or a product is going to represent the exact same thing that we're talking about in our sales context, OK? Um, now, the opposite of this is if you think of uh, an app in the straightforward, I'm going to call it straightforward MVC, uh, where you have models, views, and controllers, and everything needs to fit into one of these buckets. Uh, then what you really have, so the problem doesn't really change. You still have the same subdomains. Like the problem is the same, but your solution is different. You now just have one app that's one big context. So everything, like if you have a customer, everything is going to go into that customer, or you start adding prefixes uh, like sales customer or support customer or stuff like that, but everything is within the, this app context. So you, you have uh, your solution space is now covering uh, or going over all of the, the different subdomains within the problem space. And this is really uh, something that I've definitely done a lot in the apps that I've built. Uh, and once you start growing your app, this is where all the problems, I think, come from, or a lot of them, actually. Uh, and uh, the God models that I was talking about, the behavior magnets, that's, I think, this is a, a big culprit of that. And of course, all of that will eventually uh, slow the pace of your of your team because everything is in the same context. Now you're trying to to model your entire domain into the same thing, uh, and and it's not always easy. Okay, so that was about it for subdomains and bounded contexts. Uh, and the, the last concept I, I want to talk about in terms of the DDD theory uh, is the concept of aggregates. So we're now inside of a bounded context. This is the example of the sales bounded context. And we have these different entities, which are the boxes. Uh, and we have these almost circles, which are the aggregates. Uh, a lot of the aggregates can just have one entity. They're not super interesting. Uh, but an aggregate can have more than one entity. And what that, that means uh, is that if you have, if you have a, an aggregate with, uh, let's say, these two entities, customer and address, it should really be treated as a whole thing. 
So that's the point of the aggregates. It's, it's one thing, and it serves uh, as a way to uh, uphold uh, domain invariance. For instance, you have this business rule that there cannot be more than one customer per address. The way that's going to be handled is uh, there's going to be an aggregate route. Uh, that's the, the customer here. That's the aggregate route. That's where the outside of the aggregate communicates to it. All, all the calls come through the aggregate route, and it's its job to know the, its internal state and manage uh, that internal state and uphold that domain invariant. So it's a consistency and transactional boundary for the rest of the system. Uh, you, you, can, you can think of it. For the rest of the system, there's only like the customer, but internally the customer has a separate thing that's an address. Uh, so this is an aggregate, that's an aggregate route. Usually uh, we name the aggregate after the aggregate, aggregate route, so in this case we would call this the customer aggregate. Uh, and now again the parallel to uh, umbrella apps or in Elixir, uh, I said bounded context, we, uh, or I usually do that with different apps. Different aggregates are usually mapped very well to different actors, so different processes. Uh, it could be very well that this is a, a gen server, if you use that, so uh, a generic server that holds its own state, and uh, the way then the outside world then talks to it is, as we've seen in the other talks, you have a process ID, you send messages to that, and then it has its internal state and manages all of this. So it maps really well to, the, to this uh, actor model. Okay. Uh, at this point, some of you might be thinking, uh, this is duff, we call it, so this is a lot of big design up front, we need to think about all of these things, and it's not. I want to really stress that uh, the idea is not to achieve the perfect domain modeling, because that's not going to happen. Uh, the idea is, think about this a little bit, communicate within the team, reach uh, the main model, that uh, command query responsibility segregation, sorry. Uh, what this means is, uh, first, before CQRS, we had CQS, which uh, stands for Command Query Separation Principle. And it's actually a simple but powerful principle. Uh, it states that, and this is for uh, a function or a method, or whatever you want to call it. If you have a return value, you cannot mutate state. Uh, and I'm going to change this a little bit for languages like Elixir or Ruby, which always have a return value. You cannot really return void. Uh, so if you have a return value you care about, you cannot mutate state, but if you mutate state, then uh, you cannot care about the return type. So the idea is you have commands that mutate state, somehow uh, it can be uh, an internal state, doesn't matter, if, uh, or create a new state in case of uh, Elixir or any language that uses uh, immutable types. Or, uh, and so that's commands, and then you have queries that where you just do a query and you get uh, a return value back, but the query cannot change anything on the state. So that's CQS. Uh, the difference here is that CQS, this is exactly just what it says. So you can have a class or a module that has these commands and queries all together. CQRS takes uh, CQS and adds a, a, an extra la layer that says that each responsibility, so commands and queries, need to be on separate models. These need to be separate classes or modules. Uh, so what this gives you is something like this, uh, where you have a command model that you can send commands to. It will, for instance, persist data to the database, and you have a query model you do queries on. Um, in this example that I have here, they're both on the same application, but th that's not even necessarily true. They can be in different applications, uh, and that will give you uh, s some powerful things to work on. The idea behind CQRS uh, is that it's, uh, it's not possible to create an optional, optimal solution for l every situation uh, using just a single model. Uh, this, this thing uh, builds then on top of the next thing I want to, or the next thing builds on top of this, uh, and what I want to talk about now, again, very, very briefly, is event sourcing. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard about it, but... Um, Event sourcing is very coupled with CQRS. They both are very evangelized by Greg Young, which is the, the guy that came up with the terms. Um, event sourcing, and now we're going to put all of these I've been talking about, we're going to put it together. So we're going to now look at CQRS with DDD, and it kind of comes into uh, event sourcing. 
The idea is that you have your bounded context, it's a green box here, you get a command. That command will go to an aggregate root, and the aggregate root knows, knows how to translate uh, a command into an event. So event sourcing it works uh, all with events, that's just, uh, th that's what, why the name is event sourcing. Takes a command, transforms that into an event or events, can be more than one, and persists the event into an event store. The event store can be a, data, a relational database, it could be something else, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and the other thing the aggregate root does is uh, manages its own internal state and publishes the event uh, somehow. Again, I have there a message buzz, doesn't really matter how, this is not important for event sourcing how this happens, but you will broadcast the, mess the, the event to every uh, listener that is, has subscribed to, to that particular uh, event. Uh, then, and uh, so this is the command model. Then you have your read model over there that gets the queries, and this is listening to uh, the events that, that are coming, depending, can listen to one or other event depending on what it cares about, uh, reads the event, and persists the data that it gets from the event. It can massage that data a little bit however you want, and persists that, again, I have a relational database, but it can be in memory, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the point here, and the thing that, that's very powerful, because these are separate things, uh, so these do not, do, do not have to be the same database, they don't even have to be on the same machine, and so what it means is that you get these events with all the data that uh, you can use, and you can then construct the, for instance, let, let's assume that's a relational database, you can construct your tables the exact way you need them for uh, your reads. So potentially that means you can just get rid of joins altogether. You can just have a table uh, or a database view, materialized view, like whatever your solution is, but it, it can be optimized for the exact situation you, uh, you want for the queries. Uh, in this case, the, in the case of event sourcing, this read model is called a projection. Uh, and the cool thing about it, I, I just have one here in this example, but for the same events, I can have any number of different projections. So I can have one optimized for reporting, one optimized for logging, one optimized for analytics. I can have these different things, they can scale differently, they can, because this is all independent, there's no coupling between these things. So it's a s simple, I think, model, but a very powerful one. And you see this is all coming together in terms of uh, GDD, separation of, of uh, concerns and, and all this. Okay, so that's it with theory. I'm not gonna bore you anymore. With theory, you're gonna look at some code of uh, how to actually implement this into uh, Elixir with Umbrella apps. Gonna give you a, an example of that. Uh, the library I'm gonna be using for my examples is called Commanded. Uh, you can totally roll your own uh, event sourcing system uh, in Elixir. There's other solutions other than Commanded. I've, I've been using Commanded and I, I really like it, so if you wanna try out CQRS and event sourcing in Elixir, I really uh, recommend this, uh, this library. Pretty cool. Uh, so here's what we're gonna be building, basically. We have, going back to our same example that we we're using, we have our sales context and our shipping context. Uh, they're very similar here, so we have at the very beginning, uh, not really a command, but we have our public API that's hiding the dispatching of the command, uh, just to make it simpler for the users. We have, on our sales module, a place order, uh, that's a function, it takes a map with the attributes needed to uh, place an order. Uh, that goes to the sale context as a command, then you see that place order, that's the command. It goes to a router, and the router is the place that knows uh, where to, s which aggregate route to send uh, each of the commands. So we know that place order will go to the order aggregate route, for instance. Uh, and then the order aggregate route knows to translate the place order command into the order placed event. So that's what the aggregate root is doing, uh, changes its uh, internal state, and then sends that uh, event to all the event ha handlers that are listening. Uh, I have here in this example uh, two event handlers, one inside the, of the bounded context and one outside, just to represent that it doesn't really matter where it is on your system. Uh, as long as the events are getting there, the event handler should work because uh, basically you can have any sort of queuing system in, in here and to send the, the events and uh, it should be very 
distributable. Uh, one thing to have in mind here is when doing something like this, you should mostly be okay with having an eventual consistent uh, system because uh, even with commanded, there's, you, you can uh, re require uh, strong consistency for some events, but it's not really great. Uh, if you can go with uh, an eventual consistency, uh, which means that you just send the events, you hope someone will catch them, and that will eventually catch up on the query models, uh, on the read models. Uh, and for shipping is the same thing. Uh, the examples I have are actually just for sales because this is really the, the, the same thing, but the shipping has a, just a different command. It's a ship order. Uh, and there's, I just have both because there's a particularity that I want to talk about between integrating this, these two uh, contexts. Okay, so looking at the code, uh, here's the main sales module. Uh, for, this is uh, Elixir code. Uh, if you're not familiar, familiar, I hope it's simple enough that, that you can read it. Uh, there's a, a function called place order. It takes all the properties that we need to place an order. Uh, and then you have uh, the place order uh, command. That's uh, a struct. I've, it hasn't been talked yet here, but a, a, a struct is just uh, like a, a value object. You, you create this map with this, uh, it's basically a map with properties but has a name. Uh, so that's a place order with uh, all the properties. And then we use the pipe that P P P uh, sorry, Peter talked about that takes the, the place order command, sends it as an argument to the router dispatch, and that will send it to the router. Uh, the one thing to have in mind here, because I'll talk about it in just a second, uh, is that we're generating a UUID here, and we're sending the UUID, UUID as part of the command. Uh, so looking at the router is very simple. Uh, it's like using uh, commanded, uh, commanded behavior for the router. That's why this creates this kind of a DSL for the router but, and abstracts a lot of what the router is doing. So that's uh, a reason to use a library so you don't have to really do this yourself if you don't want to. Uh, and you can see the dispatch takes the, uh, an array with, or a list with all the commands it wants to map to. Uh, a certain aggregate root, and in this case, we just have one place order that goes to order. Uh, the important thing uh, here is this identity part. It's really important. Important. What we're saying here is that this uh, entity, so this order, uh, is going to be represented, or the, what's going to identify this order is that attribute, is the UUID, UUID the one we just generated before, uh, and this is uh, important, particularly to communicate between contexts. So what we're saying is that there's always going to be a UUID on the order that's going to uniquely identify it. So that when there's a, a projection that's going to get an event on some other context, it will know that it, we're talking about the same order because of that UUID. Uh, so they now can talk together and say, like, now we have place order, but we can have now ship order, and we send the UUID, and we're talking about the same thing. Uh, importantly, and uh, might be wondering uh, about this, is we, what this means is that we no longer have, or we can no longer really rely on database uh, enforced IDs, okay? We have to manage on the application level our own IDs. Uh, because, as I said, we can be using totally different databases, or a system might not be using a data database at all. So we cannot rely on the database to give us IDs. Uh, and what that also means is we kind of cannot really rely on foreign key constraints as well. Uh, we, we have to manage that uh, on the application level. Uh, so that's a cost. We are at a trade-off that we are willing to make in order to have this uh, very distributable and, and scalable system. Okay, the router, uh, just to, re to recap, the router takes the command it knows to send that command to the, to the ordered aggregate root. Uh, the aggregate root uh, is here. Again, it's a struct. And it, it does two things uh, in commanded. These are, this is a bit particular to commanded. The concept is not, but the names are. So we have execute. Uh, execute is where we take the command and we translate that to an event or events. And you can see that uh, the execute function takes two arguments. The first one is the current internal state of the aggregate, which is an order. 
and uh, we can do stuff with it, and then it takes the command and it returns an event. Uh, here, we're importantly uh, pattern matching on the current state to make sure that the UUID of the current state is nil, uh, or null, the nil is the null for Elixir, and what, why this matters is we can only place an order for an or if an order does not exist yet. So this means is that there's gonna be a different struct, a different in instance, if you wanna call it, of this uh, entity order for uh, every different order. And that's gonna, based, gonna be based on the UUID. Okay, so that's execute. And then we have apply. Apply is the, the, how we tell it how to apply this uh, event to the internal state. So again, we take the internal state as the first argument, and then we take the event as the second argument, and then we tell it how to apply the, um, the state, like the event or whatever information we want from the event to the state. And here, if you're not familiar, it's just a, a syntax from Elixir to update uh, basically a map. So it's, we have the state, you can think of it as a key value map, and we want to update certain keys of that map. Okay, so this uh, will then, uh, we don't see it here because it's handled by commanded, but it will broadcast the event. And then you have uh, some event handler, which in this case is a projection. So it is gonna represent our uh, query model, uh, our queries or our read model. And this handler has, uh, you can have more, but in this case has one handle uh, function and the handle function will pattern match on the events. So any event that d does not match this pattern matching or any other that we have uh, on our handle, fun fun handle functions uh, will just be disregarded by this uh, event handler. So here we're saying we're interested in uh, order, the order placed event. As some meta information we don't care about. Uh, I abstracted this persist order. This is just uh, implementation details of storing that, the event into a relational database, so nothing too fancy there, and then return the okay atom to say, okay, we processed the event correctly. We could also return an error and say like we could not process the event for some reason. Uh, again, we are using the commanded behaviors for the handler, and uh, the interesting thing there, like it has a name that's not super interesting, but you have that start from origin, and the reason that's there, and there's, you can start from other things, is that in the, these examples, the way I showed it, you create or instantiate uh, this projection as soon, like, as soon as you have the, the, first, the, the system the first time. So every event will be broadcasted and come here at the time. But that's not necessarily true for every situation. You can have the system running for a while and then creating a new projection. Uh, so what do you do there? Uh, in, in this uh, scenario, what I'm doing is say, okay, start from the origin of all the events and send them over. So it's gonna go through the list of events, because that's uh, event sourcing. I, I didn't really uh, say this, but that event store is basically, you can think about it as an append-only list of the events. So it will go through all the events, and we'll replay them, and we'll do the handle thing for all the events. Uh, and then we'll eventually, hopefully, catch up and then it will start uh, working from there. Okay, so uh, this is how you then have your, your projection with, uh, here I'm, I'm doing persist order to persist to the database, but you can very well persist to the database and also persist to a, a server in memory. And you can have, at the same time, a, a database persistence and a, a caching layer all built based on these events that, that come. That's, uh, pretty easy to do and something that you, you can very well do. Okay, in conclusion, um, building maintainable apps, that scale is not easy. That's a premise uh, or an assumption I'm making. But that being said, I think that the, str from, and I, I, I've been doing Rails for the past five years now, so straightforward MVC is basically what I do. Uh, but I think it is flawed. Uh, and I th even for prototypes, I think, because Postponing any sort of a conversation between the main experts and the dev team or design team or whoever's involved uh, is, is not very good. You, you need to start talking about what you're gonna build and what, how are you gonna call things uh, as soon as possible. If not, 
What usually happens, you, le you leave that to the developers to come up with uh, random names a lot of times because we, we don't have to be experts in all the domains that we are coding for. Um, and again, communication with the main experts keeps your abstractions in check and in general makes it uh, for better apps, I think. Uh, so the last thing I want to say is uh, I want to give you some homework for after the conference is uh, think about the app you're currently working on, whatever it is, and try to draw, draw a diagram of the subdomains and the bounded context you currently have in your app and see how those, matches, how those match. And then think uh, if any of these techniques I just told you about, any of these, even if not the event source implementation, just the domain modeling, if it could help into separating and some concept, these are some of these concepts and contexts are even coming up with concepts that you didn't even know that were there. Uh, as a bonus, uh, you can try implementing these with umbrella apps and commanded, and uh, let me know how that goes if you do it. Uh, that's it. Uh, I'm Zemeth pretty much everywhere online. Uh, if you want to subscribe to my uh, soon-to-be newsletter, it doesn't exist yet, you can go there. Uh, I want to just thank my company for paying for me uh, to be here and allowing me to be here, and uh, that's about it. Uh, I think because of all the issues I took all the time. Uh, so I'm going to be here for the next two days. If you have any questions on this, let me know. I'm very happy to talk to you about this. Uh, so thanks. Okay. I think we have a break now. <laughs>